The swap, and quite well known to my wife, even though I've made a concerted effort to surprise her, she can usually anticipate where I will take her to dinner. She also has a natural sense of when I need some soft loving care. She has complete knowledge of my life, from awkward high school flirtations to feeling let down when I didn't get the promotion I believed I deserved. Whether or whether they are dangerous, she is aware of my fear. She is aware of my inability to listen to young children cry without wanting to pick them up and give them a hug. She is even aware of my disposition because my father was never able to give me a strong enough hug. I entrust everything about me to my beloved wife. She is aware that I have lunch at 11.30 every day since, as the least senior guy in the office, I was required to take a lunch break at that time of day. Since other people would want to depart around that time, I used to return at 12.30 every time. I developed the habit and didn't break it. However, as a philosopher ought to clarify, bad things happen. My spouse is unaware that I'm having a late and leisurely lunch today. I work for the director of the research and development branch, and the entire office is attending a farewell party for one of the senior officials. To wish Bill Thornton a happy retirement, the entire operation was shutting down as he approached his 36th birthday. I was glad to have Lyle under my supervision as he was one of the younger engineers in my division. He was creative, very resourceful, and a hard worker. I was pleased to add his name for merit pay raises and bonuses when the time arrived. Lyle purchased one of those enormous Chevy vehicles with his first large bonus. He wanted a wagon big enough for plenty of kids because he already had one and another was on the way. It seems that his spouse had the same thoughts. In secret, I wondered if his new SUV could accommodate an entire clan, let alone a single family. However, he wanted to flaunt it since he was proud of it. I got to go shotgun on the way down to the conference center because of my seniority. Lyle said, So, Ron, what do you think of my new buggy? I am that. Ron Eka. Ronald Masters is my name. I'm 29 years old, in generally good health, and well-liked in my profession of mechanical engineering, even though my work hasn't really involved much of that degree lately. Though I hadn't been a manager for very long, the amount of time it required was growing. I considered enrolling in some evening classes on personnel and resource management in order to stay up to date with the duties that my supervisor insisted on assigning. It's cool, I said in response, adding some zeal to my voice. Or is that supposed to be hot or tight these days? I can never remember what the latest slang is, I told him. He chuckled. You like it? Oh my god, I replied. I turned around to have a look inside the roomy automobile. Shoot, Lyle, I said, I believe this is smaller than the first apartment Sherry and I lived in. He laughed, clearly pleased with my observation. I spun around to face front once more, and was once again aware of how high off the road I was sitting as Lyle braked to a stop at a red light. The driver and passengers had a superb view of everything around them, including most of the automobiles on the road, thanks to Lyle's truck, as he called it. I noticed something out of the corner of my eye and quickly glanced down through the passenger side window. My wife startled me by showing up at the light with her two-year-old Taurus. Sherry didn't usually visit this area of town. She hardly ever had to go outside throughout the day because it was far from her office. It was taking too long for me to find out which of the switches on the door's panel lowered the window. I noticed another movement as I was about to open the door and tap on my wife's car window. A man's hand was forced up her skirt so far that his wrist and part of his forearm vanished as I stared. I became motionless. My stomach clenched up so fast that I felt sharp, excruciating pain. I could feel my face's blood disappear. My fingers quivered at the spot where they touched the door handle. I was feeling lost. My mind was blank, my body paralyzed. I was limited to observing. I bided my time till Sherry pushed the man's hand aside. She wouldn't put up with this from any male other than me, surely. Breathing became difficult as I observed my spouse extending her limbs. I muttered, please, no, but nobody seemed to hear. The only other occasion I've passed out was when I was 12 years old and a baseball hit me in the head. Right then, I was experiencing exactly the same feelings that I had that day. A massive weight was pressing down on my chest as my vision shrank to that of a narrow tunnel. My breathing stopped. I was immobile. Even though I'm a strong man, the shock completely sapped my strength. All I was was a hollow shell. I couldn't have done it if I had been lying over a set of railroad tracks and all I had to do was roll to the side to escape getting hit by a train. My four-year-old wife leaned back to take fuller use of this stranger's services, and I couldn't help but cry. She never protested or attempted to stop the man. I got the impression that she had already experienced this with this man, it was something she had desired and was accustomed to getting. Sherry threw back her head, closing her eyes as she became engrossed in the pleasure his fingers were providing. I was stunned by the look of lust and need for satisfaction. She had shown me the identical one the last time we slept together. The signal changed to green. I watched Sherry give the man a light-hearted slap on the forearm. I imagine she pulled his hands out from under her skirt to get in her car. Lyle sped away from the intersection, and I swung around in my seat. I observed my spouse's Taurus turning right onto a roadway that would return her to her place of employment. She had never raised her head to consider who could be observing from the large suburban, not that she could have seen me through the window's heavy tent. 
She knew that at this hour I wouldn't be out and about. I finished my lunch break 30 minutes ago. What a ridiculous, exhibitionistic display she and the man accompanying her had put on for whoever it might have been. She had not given a damn. Anyone could have been the one watching. It didn't have to be me. Sherry hadn't considered hiding the act because she was engrossed in the physical activity. Yes, my spouse was familiar with me. I just seemed to believe that I knew her, though. That night, she gave me a short peck on the cheek when she arrived home. My memories of a few years ago were of receiving long, passionate kisses at the door after a demanding workday. Along the way, their numbers had dropped until they were virtually non-existent. My wife started up the stairs, and I watched her. I suddenly realized there was a missing piece. I had been watching her perform in traffic earlier in the day, and it hadn't occurred to me. I blurted, Sherry, what the heck happened to your pantyhose? I know darn well you put on a new pair this morning. How come you're not wearing any now? After a moment of hesitation, she walked down the hall to our bedroom. It took her a considerable amount of time to look back at me. At last, she replied, oh, I got a runner in the right leg. It kept on growing and growing and I finally just took them off, she explained. She smiled back at me, giving me a closer look than I believe she would have in normal circumstances. She wanted to know if her explanation made sense to me. I gave an empathetic nod. She looked away, but not before I noticed a faint expression of relief flash across her features. I tried to seem more lighthearted when I said, I see, I had not intended to ask about the pantyhose, but an unexpected rush of pain and anger had seized hold of my mouth. The two feelings were still in charge of me. I was forced to see how far I could push my loving wife by an evil imp. I observed her response and remarked, I thought some guy might have ripped them off because he was in a hurry to get into your panties. She performed well. Other than a small stiffness of her posture, not much was seen. She asked, curious, what in the world brought that on? I tried to keep my face as neutral as possible while I stared at her. I forced myself to keep my hurt and rage hidden. I gave a shrug. It has been observed to occur, I remarked. I shrugged and turned my head away, attempting to convey the impression of a man recalling a traumatic incident. You remember Katie, that girl I had to fire last year after she got caught screwing one of the men on the loading dock? Well, I remember her coming back from breaks and lunches without her thigh-high stockings and pantyhose many a time. That was before I knew what was going on, of course. Sherry bit her bottom lip for a few moments and then turned to face me. She stepped near to me, laid her palms flat on my lower ribs, then slowly caressed them up my chest before putting her arms around my neck. For a few playful seconds, she put her tongue in my mouth as she lowered my head and mashed her lips to mine. When she eventually broke off the kiss, she remarked, Honey, I thought you knew that you are the only man who will ever rip my panties off. Her face was hooded. Her gaze shifted back and forth, looking for any clues in my face. She was trying to see how I would respond to her explanation. I felt confident she was curious about my level of knowledge and what steps she could take to dispel my doubts. My heart was once again broken by it. Having been lying by omission the entire time, she was now lying directly in front of me. It was a callous, deliberate act raised on malice and birthed on deceit. I had hoped. To be honest, I had no idea what to hope for. I guess I assumed, even though I had no idea how, that if I could pull a confession out of her, we could work through this. But it's difficult to let go of someone you love without making one more effort. Sherry, though, was waiting for a response. I had been staring into her eyes for too long, and I had given up hope of ever finding it. I know that, sweetheart, I responded, trying to seem as real as possible. Katie's husband threw her out and got custody of both kids. She wrecked her marriage, the other guy's marriage, and her life. All for a little stupid, dirty bonding out behind the warehouse. I allowed my disdain to permeate the final several Sherry wins slightly, nearly imperceptibly, but her face remained unchanged. Sherry remarked, well, she deserved it. And the trick was over now. My darling wife believed that she was exempt from the same constraints that applied to others. I grasped her wrists firmly and yanked her arms away from my neck. I gave her a level gaze and gave her a soft peck on the lips. Now go get changed. I'll have dinner on the table in 10 minutes, I advised her. I ignored him and went into the kitchen, not turning around. Update. I didn't know what to do at first. I had no idea what I ought to do. How should a husband respond when he finds out his spouse is having an extramarital affair? I'm afraid that during the next week and a half, I didn't do much work for the company. I couldn't even tell how long I'd been staring into space when I would suddenly find myself working on something. Many employees have asked me if something is wrong, and I have always said that there isn't. I had no one to support me through this. It would be up to me to figure out the mystery. In a few cases, I was able to use logic to my advantage. One indication that they had been sleeping together for a while was the fact that the man felt at ease caressing my wife in public. He would still be far more hesitant if they were just getting to know one another. It indicated that Sherry had been unfaithful to me for a while. I questioned when it had started. There were no indications that I could recall of her cheating on me. I couldn't think of any adjustments to our regular routine or shifts in attitude. Ultimately, though, the length of time it had lasted was not really relevant. The fact that it was occurring was the sole significant element. Secondly, I refused to tolerate her adultery. 
I refused to leave for work every day, wondering who Sherry was going to sleep with that particular day. To begin with, I was not much of a churchgoer. Turning the other cheek was not an option for me. I wasn't capable of doing it. I saw no use in attempting to keep the marriage intact. Throughout our four years of marriage, Sherry had betrayed the trust that we had established. Based on the evidence, it appeared to me that she had shattered it multiple times, and I was unsure of how it could ever be restored. Confronting her was the only reasonable thing left to do in order to save as much of my sanity as possible from this situation. Maybe Sherry would tell me if there was something I'd done so horribly wrong to cause her to react in this way. I made an attempt to yank my gaze back through the windows that I had been peering through. I never felt more alone in my entire life. The pain came in icy waves punctuated by bursts of rage. I couldn't stay in either feeling long enough to get any job done. Having come to the conclusion that my marriage to Sherry was over, I gave myself the grim assignment of locating a rapid means of escaping my suffering. The problem was, Sherry would probably be able to take damn near everything we'd put together without any sort of proof. The legal system in Texas is unfriendly to a guy who makes baseless accusations against his spouse. Wives were given the benefit of the doubt in virtually every circumstance in the 21st century. I closed my mind's door and pushed aside any remaining love I could have had for Sherry. I made the decision to take my fair part of what we owned. The house had some decent equity, and the savings account was finally starting to balance out. We had been making decent money together for almost a year. We had succeeded in purchasing high-quality appliances and furniture. Although we had been making balloon payments and the loans were almost paid off, the cars had both been financed. I had to catch her red-handed if I wanted a fair share of what we'd amassed. I kept an eye out for a chance. Sherry told me on Tuesday that she was going out with her pals on Friday night for a few drinks and loads of gossip, just two days shy of three weeks after I had witnessed her playing with a male. Every six weeks or so, she would do it with a group of around six other women. She stated that Sherry's best friend Melissa was not joining her, but Connie, Barbara, Miranda, Colleen, and Tammy were. They planned to gather as much information as they could to discuss Melissa behind her back. When Sherry told me that, she giggled a bit. She was not acting suspiciously at all in doing this. She had done it in the past on a number of widely separated occasions over the years. But I knew deep down that this one was unique. There was nothing in her demeanor that suggested she may not follow through on what she had promised. But I had lost faith in her. I needed to confirm her statements. Connie, I said happily into my phone. One of my wife's pals was Connie. Perhaps she and her spouse Art would visit what used to be our home for cookouts and perhaps dinner. Hey, Tiger, she said with joy. Connie enjoyed flirting and seized the chance whenever she could. She inquired, what's up? Not really, I replied. I was just wondering if you and Tom have any plans for Friday night. Tomorrow evening. I was thinking the four of us might get together for dinner and some cards. Her voice mocked seductive, she added, I'll have to check my busy calendar, big boy. There was a brief delay, but not long enough for her to be checking anything. No, nothing on tap for that night, sugar, she said. I'll have to check with Tom but I think it sounds like a great idea. What shall we bring? Just your cute little self, your better half, and a pair of bright smiles, I said. I was dead inside, even though I attempted to sound positive. Over the past three weeks, all of my pleasure had vanished from my life. All right, lady, she said. She stopped a moment and said, I'll give you a call when I know for sure, okay. Run. Tom and I are really happy to hear that you and Sherry are doing so well, sweetie. We weren't sure that you guys would be able to get things together after the Vegas trip. I scowled into silence as I listened. You understand. She spoke with a tone more serious than I had ever heard her use. Vegas, a little perplexed, I said. Sherry, Melissa and her husband, Cal, Connie and Tom had gone without me and, by all accounts, everyone had returned with small winnings for once. At first, I assumed she knew about Sherry's straying, though I had no idea how she would have known. The trip she was talking about was one I hadn't gone on because at the last minute, my boss had called, needing me to go to Denver to straighten out a mess in the R&D division in our parent company. Was Connie really claiming that something had happened in Vegas? If so, I had to find out more information, even if it made me feel nauseous. After a lengthy period of silence, I remarked, I don't understand what you're trying to say, Connie, and even I could hear the perplexity in my voice. Oh, you know how I am, it's just old TTY me, she remarked. All right, so let me talk to Tom and see if he has anything scheduled for tomorrow already. Yes, please inform me, okay. I answered, I'm afraid my voice would show how much pain I was in, and she promised to do so. I hung off as soon as I could. After a half hour, Connie called me back and expressed her regret. She explained that Tom had committed to play in a poker game at a neighbor's house, so she was as sorry as she could be. I agreed, regretting that Sherry and I couldn't attend. Perhaps we would just forget about it all and try again at a more convenient time. Two things I knew for sure now were that Sherry was not going out with the girls tomorrow night and something had happened to my wife in Las Vegas. I had to let the former go unchecked while I took care of the latter. It is said that adulterous spouses develop an attitude that leads them to believe they are smarter than the people they are cheating on, just because they can get away with it. 
they start to think they are smarter than everyone else in the world. After all, they manage to fool their spouse for a while, so they start to treat him or her with contempt and eventually, so the story goes, cheaters start making mistakes because they are overconfident and don't think anyone else is smart enough to catch them. I had no idea about any of that, this was my first encounter with anything like that, but I did know that Sherry was making mistakes. I would have eventually learned about her activities even if I hadn't seen her that day at the stoplight with that sorry sob in her car. It was a bad mistake to be in public with that man, it could have been any of our friends or neighbors in a van or SUV next to her car, it didn't have to be me. It was another big mistake for her not to have ensured that Connie would cover for her. Second, she knew that I was friendly with both Connie and Tom, and even more so with Melissa and Cal. Either of them might have called me at some point to give her up. These were loose ends she should have tied up somehow. Third, she assumed that I still trusted her, that I would stay home like a good little boy while she was out whoring around. And fourth, she thought that I would put up with a cheating wife. Sherry was in the shower, she didn't hear me, so I banged my fist down on the coffee table next to me, making the lamp dance around on its base for a long period while I massaged my hand and wrist and felt angry inside, thinking about how my wife had betrayed me in our marriage. When I thought about what Sherry and that guy were doing, I felt like my jaws were always clenched and my heart was racing. I was ruthlessly suppressing those feelings when I was around her, which made the rage burn even hotter. I was afraid that my anger was going to take over my entire life. I hated to admit it to myself, but once I got through whatever I had to face this evening, I'd take what I knew and put it in the hands of my attorney, I had him primed and ready to file charges whenever I gave him the go-ahead. And the sad thing was, I was actually a little relieved when it became clear tonight was to be their next little get-together for bonding. I was in the garage straightening up the disorder that accumulates if one doesn't give it constant attention, but really I was just killing time. Waiting for her to leave, now that evening had arrived, I was anxious to get things over with and move on with my life. Sherry left a little after 7 o'clock, just as soft shadows were beginning to make all around. I assumed Sherry was just relieved that I was out of her way so she could get ready for her date, or whatever she was calling it. That was fine with me. If she'd come out to be with me, she'd have seen the rental lemon I'd arranged for that morning. I hadn't wanted to park the rundown-looking wreck on the street, it might have been towed as an abandoned vehicle. Hiding the presence of the rental was just a tiny deception, I guess. That's the trouble with lying and cheating, the lies start to spread like wildfire and start to become more and more of the same kind. As she walked out the door, three more lies were made. I told myself I didn't care and I wished her a nice time. We both stated we loved one another. A man and a woman who loved each other wouldn't be doing the things we were going to do tonight. I opened the outside door and jumped in the rental car when she was far enough down the block that she could not see inside the garage. As I drove away, I made sure to keep an eye on her by pointing the remote over my shoulder to close the door and sped down our residential street. Ironically, I had to slow down a lot when I saw her ahead, waiting for cross traffic to clear at a stoplight. I had to pull to the curb and stop for a short while or I would have gotten too close. Following her turned out not to be all that difficult, like most drivers. She paid hardly little attention to the traffic behind her and, even if she had, she never would have seen that the car behind her was a beat-up gray Chrysler sedan that was eight years old. She was unaware that her husband was following her tonight, half a city block behind. The light was still good enough for me to recognize her car, but it was growing progressively darker, which gave me an excuse to switch on my headlights so she wouldn't be able to see my face through the glare. I saw her pull into a fairly priced motel on the far southwest side of town, following her through diminishing traffic. I quickly located a spot across the street and parked my beat-up old car in parallel. As my wife waited in her car for around five minutes, I peered out the driver's side window, getting my camera ready and trying to calm my racing thoughts. She appeared to be impatient. She picked up her cell phone and made a few short calls. My own didn't ring. She was calling someone else, not me. After a short while, a large SUV of a dark blue color drove up the street and entered the motel. The driver was moving too quickly for me to get a clear look at him, but I could tell he was a man. After pulling up next to my wife's Taurus, he let them both out. Before long, the man was tightly hugging my wife and giving her ravenous kisses. She patted his chest and withdrew a little after that. A few of weeks ago, when I was first organizing this procedure, I purchased a Z1 digital camera. I had very little experience with digital cameras, but this one seemed like it would be ideal for the task at hand. I began to snap away, photographing my adulterous wife and the man she was having an affair with. Twilight was becoming to darkness, but the exterior lighting of the motel cast enough light for the two of them to be comfortable. The main challenge I faced was maintaining sufficient camera stability. That was resolved by my hunching over, rolling down the window, and supporting the camera against the two inches of glass that would not go away in the door. Even though I was under a streetlight and less than 50 yards away, none of the cheaters across the way saw me. They were incredibly reckless. I suppose it's true that those who cheat start to think they can get away with not taking basic safety measures since they won't be discovered. The man unlocked the door to the motel room and pulled out one of those plastic cards with the magnetic strip on the back. 
my spouse and he went inside, and I took a seat to wait for them. To document the length of time they'd spent in the room, I wanted some photos of them walking out. The digital photos and downloaded images could have a date stamp applied to their faces by the camera. The exact date and time the JPG file was stored in the camera would be displayed. Even if the judge rejected my explanation, I believed that a computer specialist could explain such matters in a way that would be understandable to any court. I had faith that my lawyer could locate and get the services of such an expert. I hit a rumbling stomach. I could scarcely contain the spasms in my stomach that kept trying to push half-digested food back up my esophagus. I could taste the bitter flavor of bile. It became worse the longer I left it. Suddenly, I was unable to contain it. I forcefully opened the car door and unleashed a hideous mixture of disgusting substances onto the street. Long after I believed I'd brought up everything I'd eaten in the last few days, the flood continued to regenerate itself. Nevertheless, after a minute or two, my stomach was empty. That's when it started to hurt. For a further eon, the parched heaves persisted till eventually disappearing. I rinsed my mouth with a half-liter bottle of water after wiping it with my handkerchief. Trembling with resentment, shame, and an overwhelming sense of bereavement, I crossed the street's mess and moved a few feet along the curb in an attempt to calm myself down. I made sure they hadn't left yet by taking a quick peek at the door to that room. I came to a halt. The majority of the drawn curtains let in only a faint glow, but there was one spot, low on the left, where a tiny patch of light allowed in more light. I was curious. After making sure no one was watching, I turned to cross the street and made my way through the motel parking lot. I could tell, even from a distance of a few feet, that my dear wife and the miserable bastard who was with her had behaved in a way that was reprehensible for two individuals doing such an inappropriate thing. The curtain had not completely been drawn shut, leaving a gap of a few inches across. I took another quick look around to make sure nobody could witness what I was about to do. Even if someone did see me, I truly didn't care what other people thought. I was going to seize the chance to capture these two in the act of flagrante delicto photography. I squatted down on one knee and carefully moved the camera toward the window, focusing it through the curtain gap. I got my confirmation when I hit the power button on the camera, causing the LCD panel on the rear to light up. Behind my wife, a short, stocky man with blonde hair was getting situated as she lay on her all fours on the bed. I suppose he was the kind of man that ladies found attractive. It was difficult to tell, but he appeared to be a little younger than myself. The camera was unable to focus correctly because of my shaking hands, so I had to press the lens up against the window. To get a decent set of pictures, some experimenting was necessary. The intense light from these lights reflected off the glass and tends to blur everything if I allowed too much space to open between the window and lens. But within a minute or two, I had all I required. I would configure the camera to automatically snap six images within the room before leaving the house. I repeatedly depressed the shutter release button. I had to limit how much I watched them remaining severely queasy and experiencing greater internal agony than I had experienced since my parents passed. I reclined into my haunches and attempted to compose myself. I took a sharp breath and squeezed my eyes shut, forcing back the tears I was determined not to cry. I'm hurt. However, a person can only endure so much pain before they go on to something else. I dammed up my feelings and locked the door I thought I had closed on them earlier in the week, pushing them aside. The affection that sprang to mind when I thought of her vanished suddenly, and I was not at all fond of her. I felt sick to my stomach, but my new remoteness, my detached vision, gave me the strength to stand up. Suddenly there was a cacophony of loud voices coming from within the room. Cherry was talking, but I couldn't make out what she was saying. A second or two later, there was another, louder shriek, but this time it was a man's voice. Though I suppose they could be, I didn't know of any men who acknowledged being screamers when bonding. Anyway, I stood up and started to walk away when the unexpectedly loud bonding play started. I was worried that someone might be drawn to see what was happening. I halted behind the Saab automobile and took a long time to think before continuing on my way back to my rental across the street. I pivoted and strolled along the pavement beyond each of the motel entrances. I peered carefully under the overhanging branches, then moved away from the building to inspect the roof and every visible light post. I was checking to see if the motel had any outside security cameras. I located an area in the far corner of the building with an empty mounting bracket and a few disconnected wires, but no cameras were visible. I paused by the rental car, staring at the deserted restaurant, after crossing the parking lot. Without a doubt, no spy cameras were installed there. I could see some apartment complexes down this side street, but they were quite a distance away. I was unable to locate any establishments on the main highway that would be expected to have security cameras facing this way. I checked to make sure the cap was tightened over the lens and stored my camera in the back seat. I deliberately walked back to where my wife was, and whomever he was, were situated. I opened the pocket knife I had taken out of my jeans and argued with myself over whether or not it would be wise to do what I was considering. I shrugged and knelt next to the lover boy's back tires. I had to exert more force than I had anticipated, but eventually, I managed to achieve the appropriate speed and force to drive the blade deeply into the tire. 
I was worried that I would cut myself severely if my grasp slipped, but that didn't happen. No one came out to examine the strangely loud hissing sound coming from the pricey pair of tires. Encouraged, I changed all four of his SUV's tires and then all of my wife's tires as well. I suppose it was a naive gesture. It didn't resolve anything, and it might have revealed to the adulterous couple that someone was watching them. I concluded that wouldn't be the case. They boasted too much. Although I wanted to do more, I refrained. Had I kicked in the door and shot them all in the head a century ago, there would never have been a jury that found me guilty. I had the opportunity to murder him in front of his friends and family two centuries ago if I had challenged him to a duel. Back ago, a man could have saved his honor in similar circumstances by doing those things. But these days, we're so much more refined. These days, a cuckold has very few options available to him. I exerted my best effort. I strolled back to my rental, feeling slightly better and not at all sorry about the damage I'd caused. I slammed the door and didn't give a damn if anyone heard. I'd made the initial move toward regaining some respect for myself and getting rid of an unfaithful wife. There was not much left to do. Monday would arrive shortly, and I would speak with my lawyer for a long time. Update. That being said, Sunday comes before Monday, and said it before that. Sherry arrived home just before midnight, furious that someone had cut the tires on her car outside the club. She claimed to have seen three teenagers go. After that, she had to wait for the AAA personnel to arrive for three hours. It appears that someone else was suspected because I had not been seen damaging the tires on the autos. Though the three-hour wait sounded about reasonable, I honestly had no idea whether the three teens' claim had any merit. I gave a shrug. Everything was completely irrelevant. Still, I was shocked she got home so early. I had assumed she would be playing with her toy much later. It didn't really matter how short her tryst with the new man in her life had been, if she was spending any time outside waiting for the wrecker. I comforted her with a few words of wisdom. Soon after she entered her bed, she fell asleep. She had not desired any affection. I understood why. Her body had an overpowering scent of cheap motel soap that made me want to throw up. Sherry became quite affectionate and wanted me to be near to her on Sunday afternoon and evening. It was difficult to tell by looking at her that on Friday night she had gone out and slept with another man. She didn't appear to be feeling bad about anything. In fact, she was happier and more at ease than she had been in months. I had read that this was one of the telltale symptoms that your partner is unfaithful. They typically felt some guilt, whether they expressed it or not, and tried to make it up to their disloyal spouse. While Sherry was preparing lunch earlier today, I spoke with my attorney. He advised me to give him a call at home if necessary. He stated he was ready. He only required my signature on the documents, which he would file at the courthouse by tomorrow at noon. In the event that Sherry disputed the divorce, the images served as negotiating chips. I was going to be, as it were, a free man tomorrow afternoon. Though the divorce wouldn't be finalized for another six months, I would no longer be with the lady who had caused me so much suffering. That evening, Sherry dressed in a black lace nightgown that she knew I liked, and she swept sensuously across the carpet to the bed, where I sat. After witnessing what I had on Friday night, I decided that I didn't want her. I was trying to think of a reason why I shouldn't be around her tonight. The mere thought of touching her made me ill to my stomach once more. I pretended to be indifferent as I sat on the bed. Still, she stuck to the stereotype of the devoted wife who yearned for her husband's affection. It was a terrific time. This time, when her body finally relaxed, I left her lying there alone. I collapsed onto the bed next to my spouse, exhausted. My fingertips were the only thing touching her wrist. Sherry finally turned over and rested her head on my shoulder as she curled up against me. She murmured, oh God, honey, into my chest. Before saying what she was about to say, her voice trailed off. I was no longer concerned. I didn't inquire as to her meaning. You just needed to be here with me, I said. I hoped it was mysterious enough for her to recall the next day. She gave a slight twitch, shaking her head as though in response to my words, and then she fell fast into a sound sleep. After getting up, I had a lengthy, really hot shower. After I was done, I went to the guest room down the hall and lay down on the bed. When I passed our bedroom, Sherry was still there. Her bedroom door at this moment probably didn't realize I wasn't there. She did not enjoy that she was sleeping in the moist area. When she awoke the next morning, she would be annoyed. I slept little the rest of the night because I knew what the day ahead of me held, and I was both excited and afraid since I knew I would be freed from the demons that had been tormenting me for the past month. I got dressed and left before Sherry woke up the following morning. Though I didn't want to be near her, I knew she was concerned by my sudden absence. It hurt too much. I returned to the residence with a U-Haul truck three hours after she had left. I had brought the camera to my lawyer's office earlier, and one of his subordinates had duplicated everything on paper. The young woman's eyes showed her pity when she brought them back into the inner office. I suppose I was grateful for it, but I had a sneaking suspicion there was also some sympathy involved. I was not looking for sympathy. Once back at home, I made a few cups of coffee and went to work packing up the little personal items I had brought into the marriage as well as my clothes. I wanted to keep even fewer of the things we'd bought together. 
Although my first intention was to keep part of the furnishings for myself, I discovered that the DVD player, a 25 inches TV, and a few music CDs were all I really needed. I didn't notice anything else. I unplugged the backup hard drive, opened the casing, and created a backup copy of everything on the machine. I placed it inside my purse. I would purchase a second computer to install it elsewhere. I placed a dozen prints of the photos I had taken on Friday night on top of her dresser before I left. I printed a brief note to my beloved wife using the largest font available on the computer, making sure the entire text fit on the page before turning it in. Dear, enjoy the mementos of last night. They're all you will ever have of me. This was my second immature action in the previous four days, and in the chilly light of morning, as it were, I didn't feel good about it. However, I had put in a lot of effort the night before to have this chance to tell her, and I wasn't going to back down now. After attaching the note to the mirror, I pivoted and departed from our bedroom, walking down the corridor and through the garage door. I didn't even try to lock the place. I was no longer accountable for it. Update. I had assumed that after Sherry received divorce papers, our lawyers would discuss and decide how to divide our belongings. I assumed that after we signed the papers and appeared before the court, everything would be resolved. Me being silly, it appeared that talks between lawyers had to be a protracted, drawn-out procedure that turned into negotiations over the most trivial matters. For example, I am aware that the attorneys spent an entire lunch hour, which I paid for, of course, debating whether or not I needed to give back the TV I had brought with me or if it counted as my portion of the home's electronics. Who cared? Either way, it was taking an eternity. In the end, it all came down to the sale of the house and all of its belongings and an equal distribution of the money, of course, after the lawyers received their cut. Any furniture or other items in the house that Sherry and I really liked would be noted, and if none of us objected, the item was ours, up to a total value of $5,000. I was indifferent. I had already decided what to do. I instructed my lawyer to proceed without delay. I went over to Cal and Melissa's house a few weeks after the divorce petition was filed, but before our first court date, to try and find out some answers about how this whole thing got started. In college, Melissa was Sherry's closest friend, and I had a passing acquaintance with Cal. We had all gotten really close over the previous few years. Melissa had grown to be Sherry's friend as well as mine. It was until after the Vegas vacation that I discovered Cal and Melissa had not visited our home or extended an invitation to us to stay at theirs. Given that Connie had mentioned Vegas, I was interested in finding out whether Melissa and Cal could provide any insight into the issue. When I got there, they were in the backyard. Cal came around the side of the house when I rang the doorbell, got me a cool beer, and had me sit under the large pecan tree shade that grew in the far corner of their yard. We sat for a few uncomfortable minutes. Finally, I said, so. Melissa started crying and got up to go for a run inside the home. Cal and I gazed at the door that she had vanished through, and then at one another. Cal murmured, she's a little emotional sometimes. I acknowledged the anguish everyone was experiencing while grinning a little. I know, I remarked. I adored Melissa because she was honest in all she did. She was closer to me than my late sister had ever been, in many ways. I gulped down a long drink of Coors Best. Cal, you know that Melissa and I are really sorry that you and Sherry are splitting up, but we didn't know what to do, he added, drawing a long breath. Ron, I asked him. His expression of understanding was growing, as I could see. You're ignorant, he uttered. I gave a head shake. From the ice chest next to him, he took two more beers and gave one to me. He said sadly, we didn't know whether to tell you when we got back from Vegas or not. We thought that surely Sherry would tell you what happened, it couldn't be kept hidden, and, after a while it seemed she had and the two of you had everything all worked it out. I asked in a low voice, worked what out? After taking a big breath, Cal spent the next 20 minutes describing Sherry's messy drunken behavior on her first night in Vegas. Sherry had told the other two couples that she would find someone else to be there for them if I couldn't make it at the last minute, and she was exhausted and upset about it. Sherry danced and flirted with every man who caught her eye for the remainder of the evening, downing hard liquor. Sherry and a blonde gentleman eventually vanished from sight, despite the best efforts of the other two couples to follow Sherry and the guy throughout the casino. Sherry was not seen until the next day. Melissa and Connie had gone to Sherry's room that said afternoon and knocked on the door until Sherry eventually answered. Melissa had told Cal that she appeared to have been ridden hard and put up damp. The fair-haired man had entered the restroom, but had now left. Sherry had been reticent, inebriated, and rebellious all at once. The man had appeared utterly indifferent to the entire situation. He eventually left, but Sherry didn't show up with Melissa, Cal, Connie, and Tom that said a night, so they were very certain Sherry had reconnected with the unidentified man. Actually, until late Sunday afternoon, when she arrived at the airport to board the aircraft home, none of the four had seen Sherry except from that one meeting on Saturday afternoon. They couldn't claim her boyfriend brought her because they hadn't witnessed how she arrived to the terminal. They had shown no concern. It wasn't my fault. Melissa was standing behind my chair, her hands resting on top of my shoulders, having returned outside to wipe her eyes. She would occasionally pat me, the way a parent does when their child is upset. 
That was probably exactly who I was at the time, don't you think? After Cal was done, I sat and stared into nothing. I finally said, I wish you'd told me, after some time. I don't know what good it would have done, but some of the lying and the cheating might not have occurred. I breathed a sigh of relief. But the damage had already been done, I guess. It wouldn't have made any difference in the long run. Melissa inquired kindly, how did you find out about Vegas? I turned my head back to face her. You guys just told me, I answered. She didn't understand. So, tell me how you found out, she inquired. I clasped her hand in mine and gave it a light pat. I saw them in Sherry's car on the street a few weeks ago and that blonde guy had his hand up her skirt so far I knew he had to have his fingers inside her, I murmured. Their features blanched, and they both winced with compassion. Oh, you poor man, Melissa remarked. I shrugged, thinking, what a horrible way to find out. I'm not sure there is a good way, Lissa, I replied. I turned to face the grass around my feet to avoid having to acknowledge the sting of tears that had unexpectedly sprang to my eyes. But it's over and done with now. It seems that Sherry had visited them a few days prior to inform them of the divorce. Melissa claimed that Sherry was furious with Melissa for not standing by her side. Sherry said it had merely been a terrible mistake. Sherry had left in a fury after Melissa had called her a hussy and other disparaging remarks. Yes, that was my Sherry. All blame should be placed on everyone but the two adulterers. I spent about an hour more talking with Melissa and Cal before I departed. They made a great effort to convince me to remain, but their 18-month-old infant required attention and I wouldn't have made acceptable dinner companions. After three and a half months of negotiation, someone asked me about the photos I had taken of Blondie and Sherry. Sherry thought I was going to post them online. Their recommendation seemed reasonable to me, so I started looking for a website that would take care of them. I offered to email copies to Sherry's pals as well as everyone in her office. Although it wasn't my intention, it certainly restarted the conversation. I could have gotten into legal trouble if I'd followed through on my threat. One concern was the potential violation of privacy as I had taken the photos via the motel window without getting consent from either the motel or the participants. I informed my lawyer that if a favorable outcome wasn't achieved quickly, I would definitely pursue a lawsuit. The following day, Sherry's attorney brought up the subject of how to split the house again and offered me 60% of the sale price provided I gave up all the copies of the photos. However, I declined. After some time, they promised to provide me 55% of the sales revenue in exchange for my keeping only one copy of the photos and my vow to never send them via the internet. Oh, and Sherry insisted on meeting with me alone behind closed doors. I countered with 60%, agreed to keep just one set of prints, declined digital copies, and spend no more than 30 minutes with her. Ultimately, we decided on 60% of the house, two sets of images, no digital copies, and a private meeting lasting an hour. At the first opportunity, they consented to a no-fault divorce and withdrew all of their court-filed motions. In anticipation of a final divorce settlement, a court order was obtained acknowledging that Sherry and I were no longer living together as husband and wife. As legal separations are not permitted in Texas, this was the closest thing the attorneys could do. I didn't mind at all. In two more months, everything would be finished, the sale of the house and its contents could proceed, and the required waiting period for the divorce would not be disrupted. In the meantime, I'd worked extra hard to prevent my divorce from having an impact on my career. To be honest, I found solace in my work. I was the final one to depart that evening and the first to come in the morning. The big boss appointed me as the R&D branch's interim director, perhaps because he saw my newfound commitment to the company. He gave me all the challenges to go through without offering me a raise for the role. It didn't really bother me. I simply made sure that my personal catastrophe would never have an adverse effect on my career. I arrived 15 or so minutes early. Though it was not to be, I had hoped that there would be a lot of traffic and I would be late. Sherry and I were to meet in my attorney's suite in a room that was to be made temporary for our meeting. After being herded into that office, I was shown into the large chair behind the desk. They believed that would have a significant psychological effect on Sherry. It would be detrimental to her. For a brief while, a legal assistant of mine, the same youthful lady who had shown me such compassion when I had started the divorce proceedings, preoccupiedly fussed over me, smoothing my tie and picking at a piece of non-existent lint. I sat there and she leaned in quite near to me. Her perfume was still lingering, and if I had taken my eyes off of hers, I would have had a wonderful look down her open neck blouse. She spontaneously kissed my forehead, encouraged me to hang in there, and squeezed my hand after everyone else had left the room to welcome the approaching party with my wife. She turned and proceeded through the doorway while standing, but before she vanished, she turned to look back and smile. After everyone had left, I stood up and took a seat at the small conference table that rested against the large desk's front. I didn't believe that artificial walls or props were necessary. I was getting rid of my wife because I had found her committing infidelity. I didn't think there was anything more intricate than that. Sherry came in and saw me sitting there quietly, arranging picture prints of her and her blonde doll beating each other up on the hotel bed on the table. I tried to arrange the pictures neatly, with six in each row, but they kept sliding off the glossy surface. Getting every line of images to line up took a lot of work. 
Sherry settled herself while I worked. She had a flush on her face when I looked up. She was more than just pretty, she was an appealing woman, if not in the traditional sense. I was aware that there was a very interesting body behind the heavy knit sweater top and knee-length dark blue skirt. I gazed at the visage that I had cherished over the course of our almost six years of dating, four of those years spent as a married pair. For the majority of those six years, she had been incredibly kind and loving. Observing her today, I was unable to determine the exact time or location of the woman I once knew's disappearance. She cut me off with a bitter you got me really good didn't you? As she interrupted my mental process, she had a mask of annoyance on her face, which was something I'd grown to anticipate from her most of the time these days. I'll bet you're so proud of yourself, aren't you? I laughed heartily. Three prints were pushed sideways by the gust of air, and I used my fingernail to push them back into position. Nah, I muttered. You've got yourself, I informed her. When I looked up, she was still giving me the glare. She started to say something that I assumed would be spiteful. I got there before her. Sherry, you cheated on me in front of our friends in Las Vegas. You didn't tell me about it when you got home, and you continued to sleep him here in our town three, four, five, and even twelve times more. You didn't stop when you got home. What is that proverb? What occurs in Las Vegas remains in Las Vegas that certainly didn't apply to you, boy. Not even a tiny amount. You were just like the energy bunny, never stopping for even the slightest. You know what, Sherry? I've been told cheating gets easier every time you do it. Apparently, it is. You sure didn't seem to have any trouble finding places and times to sleep your blonde guy. I doubt you would have ever stopped if I hadn't nailed you with some really good pictures, and then filed for divorce. I glanced up from my pile of pictures. To be honest, I don't believe you when you say you won't be seeing him anymore, I firmly told her. I think you're lying in your teeth. She yelled, it's true. She reached out, grabbed one of the photos, and put it up in front of my eyes. Right after we went into the room, I told him this would be our last time. I'd already decided to stop seeing him. I was feeling guilty and ashamed and I wanted to end it. She insisted, you see this. He's trying to hurt me here, slamming into me really hard. He was punishing me for telling him I wasn't going to be with him anymore. A little bit after you took this, I got away and kicked the sob in his balls. I gave a head shake. It didn't really matter that I didn't want to see what she was attempting to show me. It looks to me like you're getting a little rough bonding there, and you were liking it, I replied. I stopped her from speaking by raising my hand. I partially leaned across the table and said, but let's say you're telling the gospel truth. If it's true you wanted to stop sleeping him, Sherry, why the hell didn't you give him a call and tell him? Why was it necessary to give him a goodbye bonding? She sighed. I know, it was wrong, but, don't bother, Sherry. I don't want to hear it. I don't think, and I never will believe, that you would have stopped as long as your horrible secret existence remained hidden from me, even if I were to take what you say at face value. Indeed, your statement may be intended. It's possible that you engaged in it for a week, a month, maybe six months, but you would have returned to him, or discovered someone else. The first darn time you were angry with me once more, or the time your car broke down, or the day you had a poor hair day. Sooner or later, you'd have had that urge to get a little weird and pay me back for every real and imaginary problem we've ever had, wouldn't you? Isn't that what you were doing, Sherry? I had worked myself up again. I had to back off. I sat back in my chair, trying to look as cool as I felt. Sherry was sobbing once more. She muttered, you don't have to talk to me like that. I turned my head away in disgust, I'm your wife. Not for very long, I harshly remarked. We're separated, the courts have recognized it, and all we have to do is wait another 52 days and it's all over with. And besides, I talk to dirty women a lot differently from the way I would to my faithful wife, assuming I ever have one again. The tears were starting to roll. Ron, I'm trying to say I'm sorry for what I've done. Can't you understand that? I'm sorry. I let out a sigh. I suddenly got tired of the whole thing. Okay, Sherry, you're sorry. I'm sorry too. Hell, everybody involved in this damned mess is sorry. So what? Where does that get us? We were quiet for a time. Sherry, I uttered gradually. I tapped my chest, saying, you've ripped the heart right out of me. Here, there's a huge void and a great deal of emptiness inside of me where I once held the memory of a lady I loved more than life itself, someone I trusted with my most personal information, and someone I could always rely on to be there for me even when everything around me was against me. You were a confidante and friend of mine. Exchange thoughts on any topic under the sun. You were my sweetheart, the only woman I wanted to make love to and the only woman I would ever make love to for the rest of my life. Sherry was crying even more, so I had to stop myself before my voice broke on the last few words. You took that all away and I can't get it back. Run. I cut her off. Sherry, you've half killed me. Screw that guy, I said, speaking slowly and deliberately. Betraying our marriage, betraying me, and betraying yourself. I inhaled deeply. Hopefully, whatever it was that you gained from it was worth destroying both his and our marriage. Because this morning I heard that his wife had dumped him and filed for divorce. That was accurate. 
The record driver remembered a sullen brunette woman and a subdued blonde man as the owners of the cars, and the investigator working for my attorney had located the garage that had dispatched a wrecker to retrieve two sets of slashed tires from a motel, take them back to the shop for repair, and return the tires to the motel and mount them on two vehicles. Every billing report had included the license plate number of the vehicle in question, and once the investigator had that, it was a piece of cake to figure out the man's name and a host of other personal details. After my attorney revealed the man's identity to me, I tracked down his home phone number and contacted his wife, who was understandably furious when I told her the truth and didn't seem surprised that she had also filed for divorce. Strangely enough, it appeared that three teenagers had really fled the motel when Sherry left her room. They might have gotten into other kinds of trouble, but I was certain they hadn't done the tires. My wife was no longer my woman, she was a stranger. I longed to hold her in my arms as I watched her sob uncontrollably for a while. Could you explain your actions to me? I wanted to see if she could contribute anything to what Melissa and Cal had told me about her remarks in Las Vegas. It took her a while to stop crying and gather herself. I inquired. With a hint of bitterness, she answered, I don't know, Ron. It's like a whole other world out there. As soon as I stepped off the plane, it didn't feel genuine. After that, I drank. The illumination was quite bright. They had me completely hypnotized. I was upset that you refused to accompany me and that you weren't there. Then he did. Was being really kind to me and told me how terrible it was that I was by myself. Ron, I just gave in after a while. The final words were screamed instead of said. When I glanced at her, I felt disdain for the first time. That's just it, though. I gave up trying to find the right words to express to her how I felt and said they wouldn't come. God damn it, that's not an excuse at all. I had to go to Denver and fix that damn glitch in the proposed power delivery system first. I eventually exploded. Had I not left, I would have lost my work, and without my income, we would not have been able to pay for that lovely, spacious home that you were required to have a few years ago. Damn it, I wish I could have joined you in Vegas. It has nothing to do with not wanting to. If I could have, don't you think I would have? What else was it? Oh, you got drunk. Excuse me, sugar pie honey bunch, but who the hell told you to get drunk in the first place? Are you such a baby that someone has to take your glass of rum away from you when you shouldn't be drinking it? Fuck you. If you can't control who you touch, you had no business even considering getting drunk. Bright lights, put under hypnosis. Sherry, what the devil does that mean? Do you want everyone to treat you as though you have a mental illness? Because you very well may. Oh, adorned by the lovely lights. Please, give me a rest. Then something else she'd said made me angry all over again, so I sat up straight and leaned across the table toward her. I took a few deep breaths and leaned hard on the left arm of my chair. And, you mentioned that he was having a really pleasant conversation with you. Isn't that simply priceless? Sherry, you are a lovely woman. Naturally, you will attract the attention of males. What now? Who the god and hell informed you that a married woman has any business allowing some random guy to comfort her, make you feel better, and tell you how horrible it was that your husband wasn't there? That's exactly what he did, Sherry. Did he not tell you that I was sorry, sob, for not being there for you? She nodded and used a damp tissue to wipe away some of her tears. Yes, I replied mockingly, and you ate it up, didn't you? I shook my head abhorrently. Sherry, damn it. You mentioned drinking and becoming wasted. You were wed, a woman who is married. Or a guy, in fact, it applies to every one of us. The truth is, you were expected to present yourself as an alcoholic in recovery. That's what I mean. Married people are similar to people who are incapable of drinking. Ever. But you did. You know what, Sherry, our marriage vows said we would forsake all others. What the hell did you not understand about that? The first time you danced with him too close, the first time you let him touch your arm in a possessive way, you were an alcoholic breaking your vow to never touch the stuff. Do you honestly believe that I'm that unattractive and incompetent in bed that I couldn't have been doing what you were doing? Don't you realize that every single time I travel, I have the opportunity to spend one or two nights with strange women? Damn it, I have to travel seven or eight times a year and every place I go, there's a secretary in the office, a professional woman from down the hall, a waitress in a restaurant or a woman in the hotel bar where I go for a nightcap. Maybe it's just a girl I pass in the corridor going to my room, but every time I go somewhere, there's a woman who I might be able to sleep, but you know what? I never have. I've been propositioned ten times. I mean by ten women. This last year alone I think, and I've never even given one of them a second's worth of consideration because I had my loving woman at home. It seems you tricked me, ha. Huh? I scowled. If I'd only known. A disgusted shaky head escaped me. For a long moment, the only sound in the room was crying. Sherry merely sat with her head bowed. She was crying so hard she didn't want me to see, and it was shaking her shoulders. Sherry had wanted to talk to me, but I was the one doing the majority of the talking, which I didn't understand. I resumed, ending the protracted quiet. I responded, you should never have let that sob touch you at all, Sherry, once again. It was killing me, but I couldn't let this topic go away. The first time he did, and you let him get away with it. You took a swallow from the cup that you could never drink from if you wanted to stay married to me. The first time you let him kiss you, you did it again. The second he put his hand on you, ah, uh, hell. 
What's the point? Suddenly, I was no longer angry. I sagged into my chair and made an effort to breathe deeply. Finally, I said, I don't know what else there is to say, Sherry. I just know you've ruined something that was really beautiful, you know that. Now, I don't have anything but pain. And it won't go away. I loved you with all my being. Hell, I still love you, I guess. I haven't learned how to turn it off yet and then back on like a faucet the way you have. Sherry said hesitantly, Ron, if you can still love me, we could try again. When she noticed me shaking my head, she stopped. She sobbed and shook her head, but you made love to me so. So good that Sunday before you left me. Not hardly. I snapped back. I wasn't making love to you that night, Sherry. I was sleeping you and making you come over and over so you'd remember it when I left. I'm sorry I did it now. It was a mean thing to do, something childish, arrogant, and worthless. I'm sorry I did it, I replied. Sherry appeared stunned, then horrified. She had placed her hopes on my desire to want to be with her again. For a while, we sat there staring at one another. Oh, and no, I'm not allowed to try again, I exclaimed after recalling the query. Finally, I remarked, I don't have anything left to try with, Sherry. You were lying to me every minute of every day, and it's a really cruel and callous thing to do to someone you love. I don't believe a word you say, and I know for a fact that you've been sleeping that bastard every day since you started lying in your teeth. Sherry, I'm not sure I can trust you anymore. I don't think I could ever trust you again while I'm not around. Sherry, I can't live that way. I sighed, tilting my head back against the chair's back and staring at the ceiling tiles. I don't know what I did to deserve this, Sherry, I mused, reflecting on our recent bonding night. It seems like I can physically satisfy you. You're a fantastic actress, if I may say so myself. If that's what you were doing, I've never seen so many staged moments together in one evening. I remained silent for a while as I tried to organize my thoughts. Sherry, you know, I am aware of my flaws. I'm not always able to tell when you're not happy. I don't always read your cues quickly enough. I understand that there are moments when you want to chat to me but I'm preoccupied with something else and I'm not sure why. Sometimes I'm not sure I even understand what you're asking me to do. And I have no idea how to communicate with you when you're angry. But, right off the top of my head, I've never shut myself off from you. I try to be considerate, even if I don't succeed all the time. Hell, I only watch one football game a week on TV just to make room for a little extra time with you on weekends. I take you out when we can afford it, I bring you flowers or a little something every so often. I guess I don't do everything I could, but I try. I guess there are a lot of times I'm not the man I'd like to be. But what the god in hell did I ever do to you to make you do something like this? Nothing. Nothing at all, Ron, hurriedly stated Sherry. It was just me, all right. I did something incredibly mean, and stupid, and spiteful. And I'm sorry for having hurt you. I'm so ashamed and I feel so, so, unclean, that I did those things with him. Ron, I feel guilty all the time now. I wish, I wish so bad that I could go back and stop myself. But I can't, Ron. I can't push some undo button and make it all go away. I wish I could. She was quiet. For now, I suppose she was all cried out. Sari, I just can't stop wondering, I remarked in a voice that was almost audible above a whisper. When did you make the decision that you could sleep him and it would be all right? And how did you make a decision like that, huh? What made it okay in your mind to use bonding with someone else to solve a problem you had with me? In the same voice, she replied, I never made a decision to do any of that, Ron. If I had been making decisions, I wouldn't have made this bad a mistake. It just happened. I didn't want it. I didn't go looking for it, she stated. That completed it. I was done. I sat up straight in my chair and began stroking and gathering the images into a tidy stack. I had had enough of the nonsense. I briskly replied, no, it didn't just happen. Let's be honest, Sherry, you made this happen after you returned home. You also damn sure did want it and you most definitely did go looking for it, at least here in the town we live in, even though I believe you when you say you didn't in Vegas. Come on, Sherry, you weren't just strolling through the casino that night and suddenly find a strange D sticking out of yourself. No sir, Bob, that's not what happened. You let this happen. Sherry, please accept some of the blame for this. This was no bolt of lightning striking a clean sky. You tried it, you enjoyed it, and you continued. Utterly, she was, I suppose, shocked when she glanced at me. It wasn't an error either, I said. A mistake occurs when you reach for a tomato soup can in the grocery store and take away a mushroom instead. This is more akin to the mother of all disasters, in fact. And, I guess that's just the way it's just going to have to be, Sherry, I replied. I can't live with a woman I can't trust. They don't have chastity belts anymore. And I wouldn't lock you in one if they did. If I have to worry every time I leave your side that you're going to be sleeping some guy when I'm out of sight. Well, I'd rather just get out of the situation. I'll leave you to every Tom, Dick, or Harry you want to sleep. Or do all three of them at one time, for all I care. I put the images in my jacket pocket and got up. She stood and met my gaze across the table, saying, I don't have anything else to say, Sherry, and the time we agreed to talk on is almost over. Do you have anything you need to say to me? Just one thing, Ron. And then you can go if that's what you want. I just thought I could explain to you what happened and see if we might could find a way through this. I quickly grabbed one of the images out of my coat pocket. I showed it to her, holding it by one corner. 
If it didn't, what Cal and Melissa told me would have done the job sooner or later. I don't understand where you're coming from, Terry. This is it. This is what occurred. This one snapshot tells me all I need to know. Are you not understanding? You cut me out of your life when you closed the hotel door behind you and went up to your room in Las Vegas with that man. With that one deed, you ruined the marriage. It's just garbage stacked on top of more garbage. Nothing about it can be rationalized away. The facts are what they are, and nothing on this beautiful planet will alter them. I don't know what else I can say. Well, how about if I say there is no explanation that will change a damn thing? Does it make it any clearer? She appeared to muster one last ounce of bravery. I suppose she totally missed what I'd just said in the process. She undoubtedly said nothing about it. Run, I love you and I will always love you. I want you to remember that, she concluded. I've been selfish, petty. I've screwed things up bad, but I won't ever stop loving you. Can you understand that, Ron? I grinned. I gave a shrug. There was no doubt in my mind that she felt she did, standing here with me in this room right now. If love was that adaptable to allow her to do what she'd done, then it was an extraordinarily one-dimensional, self-serving kind of love. I turned my back on the woman who had been my wife and tugged my jacket across my shoulders so that it fit better. Ron, I'm... Without turning to face her, I murmured, sorry. Yeah, I know. Neither she nor I said anything further. I walked out the door and Sherry made no attempt to touch me. I was happy. I loved her just as much as the day I married her because I knew deep down, hidden away in a vault I'd never access again, whatever it was she felt for me. This was beyond the power of love. She had denigrated both me and our marriage. It was best to leave it behind since there was nothing left to salvage. I closed the door behind me, not producing a loud echo boom noise in the hallway, but shutting it securely. My comment, do you think this story deserves a part two? I will see what you guys tell me. Comment down, would you touch your wife knowing she had an affair before? Comment down below, sub and bell and see you in the next one.